Welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Podcast Show. I'm coming to you from the North Shore of Oahu, where weekly I interview some of the world's most inspiring people from business, philanthropy, and entertainment. I love collecting humans, and these are some of my favorites I've found along the way. This podcast is brought to us by Capita Financial Network. Do you need help with the next steps of your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, state attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call or schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube. Hi, welcome to the Lindsay Hadley podcast show. Today, we I, we have an amazing guest. I'm super excited to introduce Greg Warner, who's the founder and CEO of Market Smart, which is a fundraising technology platform. We're really excited to hear from Greg how he's disrupting and innovating um, the fundraising world, especially for nonprofits and causes we care about. For those of you who've listened to my show, you know that my background is in philanthropy and social good work and I'm very passionate about this issue and have been, you know, a fundraiser myself for most of my career. So I'm really excited for Greg to share a little bit about what he's discovered and learned and talk a little about his journey as an entrepreneur, um, getting through hard things. Greg, you know, I read some of your story and it sounds like you've been through a lot and some betrayals and heartbreaks and difficulties as as is the peril of being a human and living this and being in existence. It comes with the price of suffering. And um, hearing his insights on how he's gotten through it all and um, the success they're currently experiencing. So, Greg, thanks for coming on the show. I'm so grateful to have you on. It's my pleasure. So, Greg, um, why don't we start off by having you tell your story? Like, and feel free to share wherever you want with your background professionally. Give context, you know, to our listeners about who is Greg Warner, and then we'd love to segue into learning a lot more about Market Smart, your current company, and. And all of all that you guys are providing is as a utility of value in the world. Okay, thank you. What an honor. Um, okay, I'll give you the, the highlight reel is that ever since I was a kid, I thought I would be the owner of a flamboyant, amazing ad agency. Yes, and uh, I, I, I always wanted to be an ad man. But uh, when I finally launched my own marketing agency back in 2008, after a short three years, I realized that everything I always wanted wasn't what I really needed. And uh, plus, the world of advertising wasn't what it was when I was a kid. It had become more about direct response, uh, marketing automation, and uh, websites, landing pages, search engine optimization, all that. It was different. Um, and I hated it. I didn't like it. But what what I did was I I, I decided to um, develop sort of a product for um, a, a turnkey solution for CEOs to hire me, which was that I would survey their past customers, and then we would use that to generate leads, which we would automate nurturing lead nurturing for. We would develop that whole system and program, and we were an early HubSpot partner. Um, so we kind of mishmashed SurveyMonkey with HubSpot, and then we prioritized leads for their sales team. And by focusing on past customers, the ROI was exceptional. And that was a nice trick. And uh, I figured, well, I'll just do that for lots of companies. But then I started doing it for my favorite charity, because the donor experience, I, I felt as the more money I, I, I earned and the more money I gave away, the more the experience was terrible, I guess I should say. <laughs> the more they would sell my name to other competing charities. They would invite me to events. You go to the events, you feel like you're being overly um, ambushed for money, you know, raffles and all, uh, silent auction. It's just wasn't fun for me. I'm a Gen Xer. I guess maybe for other generations that was fun, but it wasn't fun for me. And um, and I would even get like nine by twelve mailers that would solicit me, asking me for thousands of dollars. I, I live in a nice neighborhood, big house. 
You know, I have all the things that show up on big data that I should be solicited uh, for lots of money. In fact, I've looked at those those data tools and they say that they should ask me for $50,000 right out of the gate, which is nuts. So let's suffice to say, I thought that the way that people raise money and came at me was not nice. And I started helping my favorite charity to raise money using my little system, my little turnkey system. They referred me to another and then another and another. And finally, one day in 2011, I decided, why don't I just help charities? Let me just kind of stamp this out. And besides, it made me feel a lot better than selling like roofing. Nothing against selling roofing, but I liked the charity space. So that's kind of the highlight reel. <laughs> Happy to delve in deeper in any that's amazing. section of that. Well, I love what you said because you're so right. Like misinformation can lead to such a negative interaction um, in any sales capacity, but especially fundraising. There's something about the relational aspect of fundraising that feels so much more important and, and actually is because the, the ROI doesn't go directly back to other than like points in heaven and warm fuzzies for doing a good thing. You know, like the the value of the return does, is paid it forward, right? In fundraising, someone gives and the utility of that dollar goes to someone else. And so the real value is in relationship with the impact you're having and the people that are dealing with you. So tell me a little bit about your um yeah like what exactly your software does and how this works and how it's changed the way people can interact with um potential donors that's so exciting sure so let's um uh it's really a mashup of survey monkey hubspot and by the way we're no longer a partner or reseller i have since developed our own software and system and it's so it's a mashup of like surveying and marketing automation uh, plus adding in a lot of analytics and some AI, which spawns what we call our virtual fundraiser. So in other words, the problem with the sector is that they target people through what they call prospect identification. And two thirds of the time by identifying prospects to go after at least two thirds of the time, the fundraisers say that those people are not really qualified for outreach. But that only happens after they've made the outreach and spent a heck of a lot of time and money on all the data, the research and, and trying to, to, to get over the valley of distrust and get them to even answer the phone, maybe go to lunch or get coffee. And then they find out, holy cow, this person doesn't even have this kind of wealth or they're in the middle of something in their business and you know the timing isn't right. There's all kinds of reasons why it becomes a humongous waste of time, which is a waste of donors past dollars. So what, what I've developed is a pre-qualification methodology that's donor driven. In other words, it lets donors drive and self-qualify their level of interest and readiness for outreach from a VIP conduit guide counselor who is an insider for the nonprofit. Um, we take the data from, from survey responses. And what's amazing is that people always say to me, I, I never fill out surveys. And I'm like, well, that's great. That's fine. But we average anywhere from 10 to 30% of the people that we email respond. So I get your anecdotal research, but this works. And the reason, there's reasons why it works, which is different parts of the, I'll shortcut the different parts of the brain light up when you get a survey from your favorite charity, as opposed to when you get a survey from like Toyota. Okay. These are people categorize charities in the part of the brain that thinks about family and love. That's why philanthropy is, is all about love. Okay. So people take the survey and that spawns our automated lead nurturing or what they call in fundraising cultivation, um, which is driven by what the donors and supporters say in the survey. And then we monitor where they click on the charity's website to determine recency of engagement and potential readiness for outreach. 
the emails that are sent look like they're coming from a human who's a high level person at the charity and they're written thanks to AI to be highly personalized and relevant and text only and to never solicit or ask for money. In fact, all they do is they give people links to download information, view content, or gain some checklist or something helpful, take a quiz even that is highly, uh, that will resonate with the individual because we know and they told us why they care and where they are in the consideration continuum and so on. So the longer this goes on, um, the, the more the pipeline gets filled, the more people get warmed up and people who never respond actually end up giving more because they're not getting over solicited. They're just getting a nice VIP connection. So let me pause there and make sure all that makes sense. Yeah, that does. I mean, it resonates with me like it's a fundraiser, you know, um, it's interesting to hear you say that they will respond to a survey because yeah, I, I you know, I don't like getting surveys. I'm always like, Ugh, if I have to do one. Uh, so that's, that's a fascinating um, research and, and insight and data. It's actually a self qualifier because the most passionate people who care the most about the cause will take the survey because they want their voice heard. They want to help. They want to provide their feedback. So it's okay if 75, 80, 90% don't take the survey. We're looking for the people who care the most, have the most to give, and are at that time in their life where they're interested in finding meaning through philanthropy. Yeah, that resonates. Like somebody who's really invested would take that, which is already like a good qualifier of their potential further investment of time and energy. So that makes a lot of sense. So you have them qualify. Do they, do they out? I mean, this part is really like a paradigm shift for me. They're outing how much they want to give or how much they're willing to give before you even build a relationship or. They, they sort of do, but not exactly. So it's too early in that stage of the consideration continuum to ask them to give or to ask them how much they want to give. So what we do at that early stage in the survey is we invite them to share among other things. In fact, first, let me say, that's one of the last questions. What, what we focus on primarily is understanding how their life intersects with the cause, because the greater the intersection, the greater the likelihood that they'll be willing to talk and give. And the intersection is composed of three components, primary components, key foundational elements that are required for major giving. And they are the uh, the life story of the individual and or the um, the person who inspired them to care about the cause might have been their grandmother that taught them how to give. It might have been a doctor that saved their mother's life. It might have been um, somebody who gave them a warm blanket when they were a kid and they were homeless. Who knows? Um, but it starts with their life story and how it intersects with the cause, their values how they see the world, how they want to change the world, and then their community or tribe. Uh, these are the people that they gain a sense of belonging with or the people whom they want to help. That makes, that makes a lot of sense to me, Greg. So you're getting to understand their why, their purpose, their connection, and their heart about something. And then, and then that basically like helps the fundraisers be informed about right where to move next i mean it's just great insight that that's really cool that it's self-governed so there's a there's a process that that i've developed I, it's very simple for fundraisers like it's why what how so you don't you can't really skip steps and generally you have to start with why you can't start with how do you want to give do you want to sell a building and give it to our charity just generally doesn't work but if you connect the dots and help them reconnect the dots for themselves. Oftentimes people don't know why they're giving the one check and then they need a survey to help them reconnect their why. And then the next questions relate to what? And then finally, the, the last set of questions near the end, and it's very quick, ask them about how. But the way we do that is we simply say, where are you in the, the likelihood, using a Likert scale, in the consideration continuum for considering 
giving assets. So people who don't have assets don't mark that they would consider giving assets on the Likert scale. People who do have assets and will break it out, like would you consider giving real estate? Would you consider giving by beneficiary designation in life insurance or uh, in, your, in your will, a trust? Um, you know, business interest, stocks, donor advice. Do you have a donor advised fund? Things like that. And then finally, we wrap it up with some demographic questions. Most importantly, uh, is to find out people's ages. We ask it in a range. We don't want the specific because people don't like to give that out. Uh, but also whether or not they ever had children because people who never had children give substantially more in relation to what they've got which makes complete sense. Yeah, they're they're leaving less to progenitors. They're they're they have, they want to give it to someone and they don't. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Not Uncle Sam. Yeah. A anybody but Uncle Sam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so true. Um so so Greg, I mean, how is it going so far your company? How how long are you in your process? Where are you in your growth and do you have some major um you mentioned your favorite charity? I'd love to know what that was. And then do you have major charities that the public would know that are now clients or are you using the utility of your, your platform? Yeah. So the charity was my favorite charity. They're no longer my favorite charity because they've had like seven leadership changes since the time of this and found out that they're just not, they're just not the right fit for me. But my wife is an insulin dependent diabetic and has had lots of complications with that. So the charity was a diabetes related charity. Um, but now we've got hundreds of organizations that use the system and, uh, mo mo many of them, you know, you know, Salvation Army, um, uh, City of Hope, um, you know, University of Texas, Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, uh, generally it's over five or 10 million in revenue, uh, because the, the, the system isn't exactly cheap, but we do it all for the organization and um, that way, generally, their marketing team isn't capable of really mishmashing all of this together. And even if they could, then they end up with a bunch of Excel files. And you really need a dashboard and a notification system that helps create alerts and prioritizes the donors for outreach or helps the donors set appointments with the fundraiser all on their own. It's so, um, it's not, it's not cheap, but it is effective. And we have a 10 to one ROI guarantee because, and we've never had to give anybody their money back because it always works. But our goal is always a hundred to one ROI for any charity that signs up. Um, and, and that's, that's very possible. I'd say about 20% of our customers get a hundred to one ROI. And then what they do is they, they kill their bake sales and their, uh, their galas and whatever else is not producing an ROI, but they have a lot of, um, legacy pet projects that maybe two board members enjoy and that's it. So they, they'll put those to bed and then invest more in this more donor driven modernized approach that's amazing the guarantee you have i love that that's got to be such a great selling point to these nonprofits because they're always worried about overhead i actually executive produced a film called uncharitable and it's a oh. it's a non it's about a lot yeah dan palata's work yeah so it's actually in theaters right now and it's a 90 minute exploration of his ted talk the way we think of charity's dead wrong so you probably really love that narrative. He's in, I wrote about him in my book. Incredible. So yeah. Um, so we made a film about Dan and he's my partner in that film. And um, Stephen Gyllenhaal, Maggie Jake Gyllenhaal's dad is our director. And then Ed Norton's featured in it and lots of nonprofit luminaries. And essentially what we talk about is that you need to spend money to make money and take risk. Right. And, and what I love about what you've done is you, you're, you're saying use the utility. This is expensive, but it will see a return but you've kind of removed any of their fears in the guarantee. I think that's fabulous. That's really cool. Yeah, I I, I kind of do disagree. I, I agree with almost everything mm -hmm. that I've seen come from, from Dan, but I do disagree that um, you necessarily need to spend money to make money. And the reason why is because charities, most charities are already overspending in the wrong places. So you don't have to spend more. 
they just actually need to cut out a lot of the junk mail and the spamming that they're doing, the over solicitation and the events that only, if they're lucky, create a one to one or a two to one ROI. And they just need to um, use that money for a more efficient process that um, automates what fundraisers would do if they only had the time to create that one to one personal connection. Uh, by leveraging technology. Love so, it. yeah, I love what you're saying. Yeah, you're saying there's a lot of waste. And one of the things that we've realized in the nonprofit sector, though, is visionaries, talented entrepreneurs, type t the types of people that would see that and see those kinds of problems have marketing insights and understandings, understand data. You know, a lot of times they're the type of people that are in the private sector. Those kinds of minds go so solve problems often that can be measured by ROI. And the nonprofit space tends to not generate those types of people because we don't pay them well, right? So hiring the best talent and spending money on like the right things, right, is is a big part. But I love what you're saying about it's more about spending it more efficiently. Couldn't agree more. Um, but, you know, we really go in deep into the idea that, you know, spending more on the marketing budget up front will later have a greater return, right? So it's like in your case, you know, that that. That makes sense. It's just though, um, that's giving, <laughs> it's funny, you'll probably send this to your friend Dan now, but that's giving, um, that's giving people in the sector a jagged pill that they're just not going to swallow. Uh, I'd rather see them reappropriate the funds that they already have and use them in a more effective and efficient way. The, the challenge I see is that the, the sector has an infection, but they don't know that they're sick. So it's kind of like they're carrying COVID, you know, I forget what they call it, the, the kind of COVID where you, you don't know that you have it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and what that illness is, is that, and I have a lot of empathy for the leaders, is that they're running two diff very different kinds of revenue generation businesses. They have to run a transactional um, impulse oriented, metric driven, uh, data driven, big data, especially, uh, driven business, very transactional, very transactional, coin operated, buy more printing, pay more postage, do more events, and then, and you get more money. But that's not how you get the big money. That's how you get the go away gifts and the very transactional low dollar donations. And I, I invented a, a free tool called the fundraising report card that I give out to the sector. Any nonprofit can use it and they'll see that their metrics and the benchmarks for the sector updated daily. It's at fundraisingreportcard.com. I don't get anything from promoting that except more data. So I get the data and then we could see that point. 7.4 to 0.75, let's call it three quarters of 1% of the people making donations supply three quarters of all donation revenue. Three quarters of all the dollars come from three quarters of 1% of the people. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means that you're investing a lot of money to get uh, low dollar donors and then frankly, uh, then they've got to run the other part of their revenue generation business. And like you said, these are not visionary leaders. Most of them are operationalists who are really good at programs and throughput and creating impact. So the second revenue generation business that they have to run is a relational one that is dealing with highly considered, deliberate, uh, very, very uh, intentional kinds of a, of, a, of a sale. It's a relational long term. So if you've ever sold any of those products, wh whether it's transactional or related, you know that the process for, for generating and marketing that revenue is very different. Here's, here's the catch is that these leaders and even the board members, when they go to work, volunteering or, or paid, their mind is thinking transactionally. It's so much easier and more convenient to think transactionally because it's very fast and it gives us a, a lot, a lot of good feelings to be like, oh, wow, we made a hundred dollars today, you know, but they have a very hard time wrapping their head around the relational one. And plus the sector has been operating like 
prehistorically with dinosaur error metrics. Yeah. Well, and they've been using an operating system that's been around for 50, 60, 70 years that kind of worked and sloppily would, would work and generate major gift revenue for many years, but it just doesn't work anymore. And the donors are rebelling yeah. uh, and retention rates are going down. So yeah. I, I give them empathy because they've got to run these two kinds of businesses and they really, they barely know how to run one. Yeah. I love this nuance. I love this nuanced conversation we're having that we're, we're wrestling with this idea um, because you said yourself, your product's too expensive unless it's $10 million in revenue. Well, 90% of charities are under $10 million in revenue. And so um, I, when you said there, most of these people are great program runners, probably the ones that are your clients at $10 million plus, but a lot of them are not. A lot of them are people that are volunteering their time and not getting paid because of the demonization of overhead, which is Dan's whole argument. And it's actually really a tremendous amount of waste of energy, time, and resources and duplication because a lot of charities are not actually having very much impact, uh, you know, because they're not spending, they're not spending money on the right things, the right people and the right thinking. And then more to the point is if your product works and a charity could say, take 50% of their fundraising budget, right? 50% of their overhead and invest in you guys, even though it's crazy expensive over time, the thinking with uncharitable, what we're arguing is you would see a return. But you need to take the risk up front because you're saying it works better. And we're saying charities are not allowed to do that because of the demonization of overhead. And so we're having them rethink. You need to be thinking about the utility of that dollar, not a percentage. Like if you look at, at a percentage as a way to tell you that the actual um, impact or the utility of how valuable the charity is, it'll utterly betray you. You know, and I always say that because I use the bake cells as a great example. They're just terrible. But like, you know, a lot of times, because that's the average nonprofit fundraiser is a rubber chicken dinner gala and a thing. If you actually look at the energy, time and output that's put into these things and how much it returns is so inefficient. Um, and what I will say is that, you know, I gave this analogy a lot, but like if you did a bake sale and you had a hundred per zero, zero percent over overhead, but you raised a hundred dollars for the issue you cared about versus an event that maybe cost $5 million because you had incredible talent, incredible production, amazing experience, but a race 10, even though it's 50%, which would your cost prefer the $5 million net at the end of that exercise or the $100, right? And that's the really the bigger argument. But what I get what you're saying is there's a lot of inefficiencies run in charity. And so to help them rethink what's actually working based on metrics is a big, big conversation. I just think that what w wouldn't it be great if most of the charities could actually use that are worthy of uh, you know their stuff use your software because they don't need to invest in my software so i wrote a book titled engagement fundraising and it lays out exactly how to do everything that we do and yes they would have to do it somewhat manually but a lot of email systems have automation yeah. and they're dealing with a much smaller list anyway. So what I recommend is that instead of doing the next bake sale, sit down and create a survey and s start with your board members and then go out in concentric circles to your most frequent donors or most passionate volunteers and just survey them. Just invite them, hand it to them, if you will, at the dark. If you really want to still do the bake sale, all right, do the damn bake sale, but give them a survey and invite them to fill it out in order to get whatever goodie they buy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's the, 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 again, sorry to be repetitive, but what they need to do is shift their mindset from transactional to relational. Yes. If it, it doesn't matter the argument about, um, overhead, if if they won't shift their mindset to become relational and work with wealthy people as new entrepreneurs and startups work with venture capitalists and private equity funders. Yes. That's the key to doing this. Hit home runs, grand slams, doubles and triples. Stop trying to do bunts in the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love think relational and not transactional. I couldn't agree more. And the success I've had as a fundraiser has been because that's my natural wiring. Um, just, I just love people. It's a genuine part of my ethos and, and makeup. And so trying to learn wh what actually will benefit the beneficiary, what they want, trying to solve their problems. You know, so, so many times I've been in conversations where I quickly realize 
I just, ask, I'm essentially doing a survey by the relationship, spending time with them, asking a bunch of questions. And I quickly see, yeah, they just gave me cues that this is not something that they're going to want to do. And I don't just see them as an ATM and just do the hit up fundraising, which most fundraisers do. They just, there's a wealthy person, get them, ask, find, invite them to the gala, do the thing. Some, some nonprofits have problems with the fundraisers not actually doing the ask and because they're too insecure to burn the bridges of the relationship. And it's like, yeah, because you didn't have a real relationship. So you don't actually know what they want to accomplish. So building a real relationship takes time, energy, and care for what they're accomplishing. You can't be caring about what you want. And I had the unique privilege of being a consultant in this space. And so I could work with high and network with high north people all day and wait for demand signals about what they cared about before I talked to them about a uh, potential opportunity for a partnership. And my posture genu genuinely, not always, I messed up and I learned this over time, but, but it was genuinely like, Merry Christmas, here you go, this gift, I'm bringing you like the best thing ever you could be a part of, not you know, you know, alms for the poor, like begging posture. I was, ne I, I found myself in value creation mode, not what do I get from you? And if I saw that I couldn't bring value, I, I would just maintain the relationship and find other ways to create value. It had nothing to do with the charity. But so many of the charities um, world is based on the stress of bringing in money. And there's such a high turnover rate in the nonprofit world. For me, a lot of what I did was pull away from certain clients or nonprofits or projects because I would bring these incredible relationships and they would then be transactional with them. And I was like, I can't in good conscience bring people to you anymore because you don't get that these aren't a vehicle to get you somewhere. These are human beings and they matter and I love them. You know what I mean? So it's interesting because I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, well, it's the transactional mindset. And this is why I'm imploring your listeners or anyone else. First of all, go ahead and get my book. Uh, it's on Amazon. But if you if you want it for free, I give out hundreds of them for free. This is part of my philanthropy. I build software I give out for free, like the fundraising report card. I have other widgets that I give out for free. But uh, in chapter five of that book, there's a, the, the chapter is titled, Don't Ask, Offer. The key is Love to it. being a value provider, yeah. not being an extractor. So the problem is that you have leadership that has a transaction and extraction mentality driving fundraisers to ask. And frankly, uh, I, I, I say you should never have to ask. You should never solicit a, a supporter. You should never do that. You don't have to. If you go through the process of why, what, how properly and you're transparent and you're not planning an ambush, which is what most fundraisers are taught to do, totally. which is, by the way, driving, I mean, these are my words I, I've added to the sector is I, I, these ambush it asks and drive by solicitations are driving what I call fundraising climate change. So this is the ever creeping slow demise of, of the philanthropic sector because what used to be just 15 years ago, 66% of Americans giving to charity, now it's below 50%. And now we're finally starting to see uh, total dollars and total dollars of giving were going up for the past 15 years, but that's because the wealthy kept giving more and more, but they're finally uh, recoiling. They're saying they've had enough. Or maybe it's the economy and interest rates a little bit as well. But the wealthy have the money. They just don't like the experience. They would rather give money to just about anything than to give it to charity because the, the charity experience is that bad. Mm, I, I couldn't agree In more. In any case. Yeah. yeah. What, I love about, what I love about technology and the platforms that we have access to, like social media, is you can now, again, have people come to you, respond. You can do ads, you can have, and then you can measure the metrics of that. What are the type of people? You can double down on what ads are resonating, right? Things are measured, and now you understand the, out, the output or the value of the ROI, and that's really powerful. But what I loved about what you said is people, the ambush, the ambush part, like, and that's something that I had to learn over time because I was relational. Um, and naturally by, by, by my default, but I would kind of be like, okay, but my job is I'm being paid to make sure I bring money in. And so there's this wealthy person, but like, maybe eventually I can, you know, find a way to like plug them in here. And over time, as I've matured in my fundraising and my skills, I really genuinely don't want to ask anyone for money that it wouldn't be an actual gift to them. I don't want to, I don't want to even 
suggest that they get involved unless I know that this would be like, you know, the greatest gift I could give them. And so I have to spend time in that relationship. But what I like that you're doing is there's only so many people with that natural skill set, that networking that are available. A lot of people with this skill set of um, sales and high emotional intelligence um, end up taking private sector jobs because the remuneration is so much higher. What you're doing is creating a system that can do that for some inside of an, an ecosystem where, where maybe you don't have the money to afford the kind of talent that would actually have that skill set. So I like I like what you're talking about. It's really exciting. And yeah, and it's also that fundraisers should not be solicitors. They should be guides and conduits for supplying VIP service and a VIP experience for people with capacity to make the impact that they want to make so that they find meaning in life and the world becomes a better place. I love it. With that, with that being said, the process, and, and I have a forthcoming book coming out next year called Making Outreach, which is for fundraisers, to explain it to them from the donor's perspective, not from, and look, there's 75,000 fundraising consultants out there in, in the market in America. Wow. Okay. They're all just, just about every single one of them are operating on a traditional way of doing things. Any video, anything you Google, anything that AI tells you about how to fundraise is pretty much wrong because yeah. that's all that's been, it's an echo chamber of garbage that's not based on the donor's perspective. It's all based on uh, what the organization wants, what the direct mail printer wants, what what everybody wants to get their share and skim off the top of wealthy people and any other kind of donor that they can find what what works is a very simple process that i've outlined in my forthcoming book and i'll just give you the super high level highlight reel is that you've got to pre-qualify people so that you're not spending time trying to build that relationship on your own, only to find out that the person doesn't really have the capacity, the timing is wrong or whatever. They don't have a deep enough passion or reason for mm -hmm. giving. Mm -hmm. So you want to pre-qualify with the survey. Right. Then you want to automate the cultivation, the nurturing part, so that when the timing is right for them, you're coming together to talk about this, but, but not to talk about giving. Your initial contact should be to talk about the process that you recommend for them to explore a philanthropic relationship with no, no necessary um, handcuffs that they have to make a gift. Yes. So that second step after pre-qualification is something I invented for the sector that I call the invitation. So fundraisers need to be trained to make proper invitations to potential donors, whereby they're very transparent and upfront. And they even show them an illustration saying, this is the journey that we'll go on if you would like to accept my invitation. And at that. no time will you be expected to give. Here's exactly what it looks like. First, we're going to explore more deeply your why. Then we're going to start looking at programs, initiatives, capabilities that we can do. And you can you can find meaning and purpose and and uh, in your life through giving to to make happen that's the what so but we can't do the what until we understand your why right. because the what is going to come out of the why and then finally when all that feels pretty pretty good and you're ready for it then we're going to start examining the how why what how and the how is going to possibly involve your 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 significant other maybe your children so you can help them learn how to be philanthropic your wealth advisor your cpa uh, and whoever else you want to involve. It's up to you, the donor, but this is up my process as your guide. And, and once you agree to go on that process with me and you accept my invitation, if maybe you want to take a tour, maybe you want to meet the children that are going to be the benefit. Maybe you want to see videos. What do you, you want to meet our leadership? You want to go out in the field. What do you want to understand the what better so that you can make the right decision? Uh, in the how stage, which the how stage is really about how do you give wisely 
And that's what your firm would help with mostly anyway. Mm -hmm. So I hope that makes sense. I yeah. gave it you like a book's worth of information in, in like two paragraphs. I loved <laughs> it, Greg. I mean, it's so, um, it resonates with me. It's, it, I think it's total capital T truth what you're talking about, about human nature. And um, I'm so excited. I got to read your book, but tell me a little bit about where um, your company is in its growth cycle. So you've got hundreds of clients or you, have you guys taken venture capital money you mentioned? No. You're a SaaS company, right? So, Yeah, we're a SaaS and services company and I, we have not taken a nickel from anybody. I, I've been self-funding this from the get-go. When we pivoted in 2011, I had this concept for an automation and, and virtual uh, fundraiser, but it wasn't until 2014 that I sat down and over uh, several weeks, I studied uh, artificial intelligence. This is back in 2014, natural language processing and all the algorithms that were being developed and could be developed for where we are, frankly, right now with generative language models and such. So uh, I had planned back in 2014, uh, well, I knew that I would never be the guy who would build all the AI. That was going to be like electric companies that we were going to plug into. So I, I let, let realized, okay, so Facebook or Amazon or whoever is going to create that. And what I decided was to make it our mission at first to collect all the data that we possibly could from thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, I'm sure we have, of donors and monitored where the, all of their, what I call their verbatims from survey responses. And they take surveys every year. Plus, they'll fill out forms and download content or attend at, um, um, symposiums or, or webinars. And then we monitor their digital body language because clicks on content are much different than clicks, for instance, downloading bequest language and, and forwarding it to an attorney or clicking on a button to give from their donor advised fund or learning how to give real estate. So we've been monitoring the migration and what emails work so that we could then feed it into the AI and the algorithms, the machine learning to understand what words work and when. So we've been on this path now for 10 years, wow. almost 10 years, uh, cracking the code on it, but it's only now that we're really able to, um, to implement this. Well, meanwhile, the system we developed requires the, the, the creation of a lot of content which we've also been building since I couldn't build the AI. So what we've been doing is automating the building of content for each of our customers. So if you've ever heard of Wix, like the yeah. automated you know, website, right. but we pulled in Wix with natural, um, with, with generative uh, language and, and we're, we're making it super turnkey so that we can spin up a system. And maybe that'll mean that we can lower prices cool. uh, at some point, but, Right now, my goal is to get a thousand nonprofits at a hundred to one provable ROI by 2030, which means we've really got to get them in by 2028. Yeah. And this, let me just say this. Sorry, I, I'm going so on so much, but my life mission is to remove the friction from the philanthropic process, especially among the people who are the wealthiest, who are only giving it at about a 5% rate now and same with the foundations. So if I can get that up to 10% by removing friction, like Amazon removed friction from the delivery of products, then I think it's a no brainer and it'll work. Uh, and we'll be able to make this world a much better place. And uh, look, I'm not getting any younger. So if anybody listening to this wants to join in, you know, and just let me know. Greg, I love it. I'm, um, I'd love to talk to you more about how I could help you with my network. I do have, yeah, I, I sit on advisory boards and also boards and, of clients and opportunities. I'd love to talk to you more offline about how to help because I, I think what you're doing is really cool. Um, and I can see what a visionary you are in this space. We need disruption. We need people thinking this way. So thank you for all you're doing. Maybe our last question, just wrapping up here. You know, I read about your story. You had your father pass away and then his wife tried to sue you for your inheritance. You had, you know, um, uh, your mother get cancer and you had somebody that was her caregiver, a nurse actually steal and embezzle money. You, you know, you've, you've been through sounds like a lot of heartbreaks and betrayals and difficulties, you know, um, financially in business and people in your, in your world as an entrepreneur and seeing, you know, 
um, that in the fundraising space, it is so relational. Where I see the breakdown comes and where people, I think, right, where the demonization of overhead really comes from, from my understanding, is people don't want to be exploited. They don't want to be told I'm doing a good thing and it's actually this person's lining their own pocket or taking advantage of me. And there's a there is this unfortunate amount of out of the world. Um, and, you know, recently we've had some famous nonprofits in, in Utah that have had a, like some horrible press and rightfully so there's been some really um, unethical behavior and people are just devastated and that trust equity is lost in these donors and then they don't want to give anymore. They're so wounded. So as an individual that's helping repair relationship in the nonprofit space and also as a human being that's gone through your own repair, what helps you in building um, faith in humanity and helping try again and trust? And what have you done to overcome some of those relational wounds of being harmed? I know that's a big existential question, but I thought maybe you might have some insights. Wow. So this isn't uh, business. This is psychotherapy. <laughs> but um, look. It's funny. I, I I reconnected with someone from high school who I hadn't talked to in, I, I don't know, gosh, a lot of years, decades. And uh, we both, uh, she's in Canada now, an old friend since like little primary, primary school. And we both shared our stories. And like, I found out that her parents, both her parents were on heroin when we were in middle school. And uh, so- Everybody's got their bag of bones to carry around. Uh, I don't think anyone gets out of this life with any better or any worse. I wouldn't trade what I've been through for anything. It's I, I had a period in my life where I was angry about it. Um, I mean, what I didn't include in that is that, you know, I, I, look, even before all that stuff written online, my dad left when I was 12. My mom was mentally ill. When I was old enough to drive, I was taking my mom to shock therapy. You know, um, it's 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 hard when you're a kid and you don't understand a lot of stuff, and these things are being forced upon you. But I've volunteered in in Southeast DC for for a group that I mean, these kids uh, make my story look like a cakewalk. So I to answer your question though is uh I think in the end you've got to find a way to love humanity. Okay? That is what philanthropy means. That's what it means in Greek. It's for the love of humanity. That's what it's all about. It's about love, life and making the world a better place for the next people who come after us. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Greg. And you know, it's fun. Every major world religion, everyone, Muslims, Christians, Jews, they all share that in their Venn diagram that actually the the faith, the the faith is espousing to its highest potential ideal of love. Like that is the fundamental intention of the religion. People bastardize that, use that, tort that, and use that to hit people over the head. And it's really tragic that in the name of what is supposed to be, you know, people's faith drawing them into more love. They use it to harm others, hurt others. It's it's a tragic thing in this world that that's the case. And but what's beautiful is that is a shared um, global goal. Like uh, even even my humanist and atheist friends have this understanding of like you said, this love for humanity. And when we have that, miracles happen, incredible outcomes. We solve our greatest societal ills. There, is, we do diminish suffering because some of the suffering in this life as brought up about what's going on right now is man-made, you know? And so I am so glad there are people like you that are, they're using their faith and their background to try to address some of these issues in the most creative way. And I'm just so excited to have gotten to hear what it, from you today, Greg, and such a fascinating, um, amazing work you're doing. So Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show. We so appreciate having you. It's been a true pleasure. Thanks for your interest. Do you need help with the next steps for your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, estate attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call to schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at www.capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, the Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube.